Hello and welcome back to the Laboratory Maniacs. I'm Dan, and today I am joined by not one, but two beautiful gentlemen. On my left, I have Siggy, and on my right, I have Cobblepot. Say hi, guys. Hi. Hey. Today, we are bringing you the next in our not-so-long series of set reviews for competitive EDH. For those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with our channel, we're reviewing these cards specifically through the lens of a competitive EDH player, which means we're not going to be evaluating the same, evaluating the cards the same as someone who primarily plays limited or modern or even casual commander. What we're looking at them through a lens of is something much more in line with legacy or vintage. The power level of our format is significantly higher than a lot of the more commonly played formats. So cards that may be making a big splash in casual commander circles or in modern circles may not even get mentioned in this set review. With that preface, Siggy, why don't you start us off? Sure. So the first card for today is Mission Briefing. It's an instant, it costs two blue mana and it reads as follows. Surveil 2, then choose an instant or sorcery card in your graveyard. You may cast that card this turn. If that card would be put into your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. What do you think, Dan? I love it. This card is super cool. It fills a similar role to Snapcaster Mage, but with a positive side that is more in line with how our format functions. Snapcaster Mage leaves behind a 2-1 body, which is sufficient to cross the finish line when you have one opponent with 20 life and neither of you necessarily have a lot of creatures. That doesn't do much when there's 120 life represented by three opponents with Timna as a major player in the format. Mission Briefing instead lets you Surveil 2, which is significantly more powerful, given that we play a whole host of top-of-the-deck tutors. So Mission Briefing can not only do more for you in that it lets you scry or, like, well, pseudo-scry Surveil, which is, like, mill scry, but it can also set itself up. Say you Vampiric Tutor for Ad Nauseam, and then Mission Briefing at the end step, you can do all of that and still cast the Ad Nauseam that you tutored that turn. So I think compared to Snapcaster, this has a lot more potential benefit for specifically competitive commander. What do you think, Cobble? Um, yeah, I think you hit it right there. Uh, there. There's a lot to this. I think people who compare this immediately to Snapcaster, uh, yeah, that's that's true. There's there's some similarities there. It's got the same CMC and uh, roughly the same effect, but the things that you can do with it when you look at the fact that, okay, so the surveil, is, it's timed. Surveil, then you may cast something. So you can choose to cast something that wasn't even in your graveyard when you cast this. And uh, the things that you can, the little tricks that you can pull with that, uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot of people finding uh, some, some neat corners that they can explore that we haven't really been able to before. Um, right now, the only instant speed tutors to hand are things like Demonic Consultation and uh, Tainted Pact, that sort of thing. Um, typically, people who are using Vamp Tutor or you know Imperial Seal or whatever, if they're looking for their Adnaws or they're looking for some sort of a you know a win con piece, they have to string it across two turns because the tutor that they're going that that they want to play on somebody else's turn is only going to put it on the top of their deck. So uh, this allows stringing together, presuming you've got the mana for it, uh, some sequences of play that haven't been possible yet. And uh, people talking about Isaac Conceptor as well, this is a, oh, you stick it on the Isaac Conceptor and mill yourself and then potentially cast everything in your graveyard. You know, it, it's really, really good. Yeah, and the timing on those casts isn't even required. You just get to cast that card. So if you mill your whole deck, you can cast things in different orders compared to right. the order you mill them in. And note, it is cast. It is not flashback. So you mm -hmm. can pay alternate costs, like on Gush or on Force of Will or on Cyclonic Rift. 
So there's even more flexibility inherent to this car than there is with Snapcaster Mage. Right. Yeah, pretty much. I think there's a good amount of space to be explored here. Overall, I feel this uh, could serve the role as a filler card in some decks in the sense that it's a nice thing to put in there as like one of your last few cards to round out the deck and like really make it hum if you uh, want to say so now the next card we're going to be looking at today might take uh more of a spot on the center stage depending on how you build your deck maybe it's even like a full strategy build around we're talking about gruesome menagerie it's a sorcery for five mana three and two black Choose a creature card with converted mana cost 1 in your graveyard. Then, do the same for creature cards with converted mana costs 2 and 3. Return those cards to the battlefield. I think this card's pretty cool. It is a one-card buried alive reanimation. It can hit all three cards that you set up with, be it something like Viscerous Seer and Anaphensa Kintry Spirit and Kitchen Finks, or maybe a more potent, not modern-based combo that <laughs> I can't think of offhand. But it's really interesting to be able to reanimate three cards with one spell, even if it does have some more restrictions around it. Hmm, yeah. Cobble, can you think of any uh, potential scenarios where you might want this? I mean... This is this is one of those cards that, um, and I'm known for liking cards that most other people don't. Uh, I'm I'm really not <laughs> very jazzed about this card. Uh, I look at things like victimize, or, um, gosh, even the Jared's orders kind of cards where you, you're trying to set up a, a combo with even just two creatures. This is presuming that you're trying to combo with three creatures and you have to have a buried alive or you have to have like a self mill strategy mm -hmm. and it costs five and it's sorcery speed i mean i i don't want to come down hard on it now because i'm sure that somebody's gonna come up with a cool idea but i i don't know how much of this we're gonna see yeah it's it's kind of hard to figure out there's it does feel like there's some space there to explore and maybe try one thing or another. There's probably like a pile or two already out there that works with Buried Alive in this. But if you look at it from an efficiency standpoint, Buried Alive plus this on the same turn is eight mana, and that is a lot. Quite a lot. mana cost is on the face. <laughs> yeah. Not that so, it's legal, but you know. Another thing too, I mean, for the same mana cost, you can cast uh, Living End or uh, Living Death, which oh, is yeah. less restrictive. And, <laughs> and I mean, yeah. way more cards. Uh, yeah. Um, yep. Given I we we don't see anybody run Victimize, we don't see anybody run Living Death. Crisis uh, Twin does occasionally run Victimize, but okay. that's it, I think. Yeah, very occasionally. Yeah. Right. I, I don't know. And I, I think there's like a Doomsday Grenzo pile that can use Victimize, but that's even more fringe. Right. I haven't seen anyone play that deck in quite some time. Yeah. yeah. As someone who plays play fringe. To take a break. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to be playing this one. So. Me neither, probably. It is cool, but it's also not easy to make work. Yeah, let's move on. Mm -hmm. Yep. Much uh, simpler, but potentially more powerful in the right shell is our next card, which is Plague Crafter. It's a creature, human shaman, for three mana, two and a black, a three two. When Plague Crafter enters the battlefield, each player sacrifices a creature or planeswalker. Each player who can't discards a card. Power creep strikes again. Fleshbag <laughs> Marauder was a 3-1. Uh, 
and now it's a 3-2. And also does way more things. I, I think this card's pretty cool. I like that they're transitioning Edicts to now include Planeswalkers. Mm -hmm. And this card specifically, having the Edict not be able to whiff without your opponent already getting the Shaft because their hand is gone. But in general, this is so much ramped up from your Fleshbag Marauder that I actually like it. I'll be putting a copy of this in my casual Mirren deck, and presumably this is going to go into more competitive Mirren builds, and maybe even into some of the more uh, creature-based Timna decks, just because it is a pretty good value piece that can also function as a combo slot, and that it'll wipe the board and wipe your opponent's hands if you can iteratively reanimate it. Overall, I just think this is a really neat design, and I like that they have moved the Fleshbag Marauder space to be more broadly functional. I'm, I'm really excited about this card. I, uh, the thing about it is that there's a lot of strategies that want to try to hit that space of, um, I'm thinking of Karanos or Doretti or um, Teferi, where they don't really have creatures for the most part, and they're leveraging the fact that they're, they're, their main game plan is around a Planeswalker. Um, being able to have something like this, where you know that there's never going to be a time where, uh, unless they have no creatures and no Planeswalkers and no cards in hand, um, in which case you're already where you want to be, um, you're, you're always going to get something out of this that is going to be of value. And if you can find a way to repeatedly get this guy into play over and over again, um, then it's almost a win con, essentially. Um, I'm, I'm looking for this in uh, Chainer. I've got, there's some, some new things in Chainer that, mm -hmm. that I, I oh. would love to try this with. I forgot um, that was a deck. <laughs> yeah, it's still a deck. Um, and I, I very much like Tayshar. And this is another one of those Ooh. things you can do Tayshar loops with. You got a group yeah. full of artifacts. Um, gosh. You know, cause, because of the fact that, sort of like Sidisi, because he sacrifices himself, you're able to do some chains with it. Uh, because he comes in, he mm -hmm. goes back out, comes back in, goes back out. And it's, I, I'm, I'm interested to try and see what we can do with this. Yeah, and like not just in terms of loopability, the card sacrificing itself to its own effect yes. is also sort of an easy way to break parity there. Because, like, you keep bringing it back, and the only thing you have to sacrifice is that this card just goes to the graveyard again and again, right. which you already want to have happen. So, right. yeah, that's that's quite pretty decent. Mm -hmm. I like it. Um, Another card in this Guilds of Ravnica set that's uh, gonna bring things to the graveyard is our next card on the list, and that's Goblin Crater Maker. It's a creature, Goblin Warrior, for two mana, one in the red, a 2-2. Two -two. And it does the following. You can pay one generic mana and sacrifice Goblin Crater Maker to choose one of two abilities. The first, Goblin Crater Maker deals two damage to target creature, or the second, Destroy target colorless non-land permanent. Okay, what's the scoop? I mean, it's it's pretty neat. This card was more than likely designed with modern Tron hate in mind, given that they printed like three cards in the past two sets that mm -hmm. look specifically designed to kill <laughs> Tron in some way. But for our purposes, it has some... Fringe applications as like a caustic caterpillar, but in red, as far as I'm aware. Right. Uh, any anything that we're missing on that cobble? So I, I like the fact that this is it's an activated ability rather than a than a, a spell that's cast. Um, thinking of people who have a, a laboratory maniac on the field and then cast silence and then want to go and do something to to try to win. Um, if you've got if you've got this guy on the table, then you can pop the lab man. Um, through the silence and give them more things that they need to do to be able to protect it. 
Um, also, being able to to de destroy a non-land permanent that's colorless. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, if someone's got a, a pithing needle that is problematic, or a static orb, or a winter orb, or um, or a paradox a, engine, paradox or a engine, chain veil, or an right. icy scepter, right? Being able to respond to wind cons while somebody's going, uh, it's just an, another. It's another surface area to be able to interact. Um, it's great to have instant speed interaction, but when you have so much instant speed interaction that, that we have in the format, um, having ways to get around the ways that people will protect themselves from it is useful. I see this as a way to get rid of troublesome creatures. This will hit Notion Thief. Um, mm -hmm. Creatures and static effects and combo pieces. I, I really like this card. Can't dispel this guy. <laughs> right. Or Swan yeah. Song, or Flusterstorm, or a mm -hmm. lot of stuff. It definitely compares uh, favorably to a braid if we look at it from the angle of being interacted with. Creatures, uh, surprisingly, are one of the like card types in CDH that doesn't get interacted with as much as others. Right. Or What's necessarily as much as it should. That may also be true, yeah. Right. So, I, I like the card. Yeah. It's cool. quite cool. Speaking of creatures. Oh yeah, this next one is really cool because it does some uh, interesting stuff with everyone's favorite seven mana creature in the format. Uh, I'm talking about Torch Courier. It's a goblin, it costs a red mana, it's a 1-1, one, one. it has haste, and you can sacrifice Torch Courier to give another target creature haste until end of turn. Yeah, it's clean. It shrinks down the CMC needed to combo with a Hulk pile from either 3 if you're looking at... Uh, now I'm blanking, the Devotion oh, card that gives haste. Yeah. Or from 2 for the soul bond haste lightning striker maybe lightning mauler yeah that one i totally know all these cards because i play <laughs> red based hulk piles <laughs> that don't have <laughs> breakfast in them but this gives you another application that you can fit more you can just pack more stuff into those hulk piles now because instead of three or two cmc being taken up it's just one and you really only needed haste on the uh hermit druid generally anyways so I like it. He's pretty cool. Cobble? Yeah, I, I think I don't really have anything to add to that. I'm trying to think of outside of Hulk piles, uh, what yeah. kind of things people would want to do with this. Um, Put it in the trash can. Yeah. Or donate it to their local school's <laughs> magic club as draft chaff. Um, right. Are there any other... I mean, I guess you can also uh, like construct a Hasted Hermit Druid line of Survival of the Fittest. That's one option with this card, which could also be cool. Yeah, I guess. Uh, other applications. What other creatures need haste? Probably nothing worth thinking about, honestly. I think the like Hulk pile Hermit Druid thing is yeah. the the big one, but that this is a really big one. Like this really helps out the red based Hulk decks yeah. with their Hermit Druid layering. Yeah, because those Hulk decks they really problem. needed some help. They they're just not <laughs> well. well. Hey, this I'm just glad means that, that maybe to help them Breakfast Hulk here. isn't going to be the only way to play Hulk. Now you have I mean, an there are of playing Bile Smasher. To be fair, there are plenty of different Hulk builds nowadays, and uh, some quite Body possibly Smasher. better than Breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. Want to talk about yeah. our last red creature on this list? Yeah, absolutely. Wait, creature? Yeah, oh yeah, it is a creature. How is that a creature? Um, I know, right? <laughs> I'm talking about electrostatic field. It's a wall, which I guess makes sense. Uh, it costs two mana, one in the red. It's zero four. It has defender. 
Uh, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, electrostatic field deals one damage to each opponent. I'll, uh, I think I can just pass the microphone to Cobble here. He, uh, he knows. I, I, I love my pingers. Um, so this is this is effectively a, a gutter snipe that's two mana um, and does one damage instead of two. Is this useful? Is this more useful than uh, Firebrand Archer? Um, I don't know. I think the places that we want to do the pingers, like for for a curiosity kind of a build, you're going to be using Reckless Fireweaver for sure. You're going to be using uh, Firebrand Archer as well. Um, if you also were running Gutter Snipe, if you only care about the fact that you're dealing the damage because you want to have those draw triggers, then yeah, this would replace the Gutter Snipe in that case. Um, if you're doing something niche like Naheb, you, you do care about the damage. The six damage is much more than three. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that this would supplant Gutter Snipe in that case. So um, I, th I think it's a cool thing. Um, I don't know if you need to have four copies of the effect as opposed to three, because I, I think that um, in the the Raza Hulk Firebrand uh, build that I was doing, the curiosity thing, it's I think I only have the two curi the the two pinger effects in there right now, just the Firebrand Archer and the uh, Reckless Fireweaver. So I don't know if this is going to knock anything else out to be able to get in. Both of those are also via triggered abilities, right? Not some sort of creature activated ability. Right. Okay, good. Because, like, Cursed Totem, uh, like, if there was a pinger that's currently played that were vulnerable to Cursed Totem, then this would have been a good replacement, but. Right. Like, uh, for, um, uh, what's the Alchemist? Um, yeah. Or there's the, the Eldrazi that's a two and a red. Whenever you cast a colorless spell, you can untap it. Um, Nettle Sentinel, um, those kind of things. Yeah, through a Cursed Totem, those guys are going to have trouble, and this is just another one of those Fireweaver effects that lets you be able to power through. I do want to point out, it does have the proper toughness for a breakpoint. Four is significantly harder to get to than three, given that Lightning Bolt, Abraid, Anger of the Gods... Any of the like fringe playable damage based spells usually only hit three. Right. So if you're worried about any kind of effects like that, this is Toxic technically deluge. improved. Yeah, exactly. There's you have to you have to do one step more to be able to kill this with damage or yeah. like or uh, toughness right. loss. But yeah. Other than that, I tend to agree. Let's okay. move on to a significantly better card that I love. Oh boy. Okay, yeah. Uh this this one is Big, like actually big. This might be one of the best cards we've gotten in a while. Uh, I am, of course, talking about Assassin's Trophy. It's an instant, it's black and green, and it de uh, destroys target permanent and opponent controllers. This controller may search the library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle their library, but it destroys target permanent for two mana. Oh my goodness, it's so good. And it's in green-black. It's in green-black. You don't need to play white anymore. This makes Bug viable in Modern. This makes Shardless Bug potentially viable again in Legacy. As we <laughs> record this, my background tab is a Shardless Bug build for this card. <laughs> oh. And, well, I guess also competitive EDH. You know, this is like Abrupt Decay that can do anything. And it's not like basics are exactly common, given that Hermit Druid is a force in the format. So I think this is fantastic. I love this card very much. It's great in anything that runs black and green, which ought to be every deck you own. <laughs> Cobble? So all of that notwithstanding, yes, absolutely. This is, this is awesome. Um, I'm trying to think of how many permanents that are that see a lot of play in the format. Guy's um, Cradle, Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale. Uh, slow your yeah, roll. I'm talking about ones. how many how many permanents that are more than three CMC. I'm I'm comparing this to Abrupt Decay. Mm. Chain Veil, Teferi, Paradox Engine. Those are the biggest ones. Right. Uh, you have Notion Thief, which is arguably in that list. Yep. You have so, reanimation uh... targets like Nezahal, Consecrated Sphinx. You have Tassiger. 
You have Karanos. Actually, he's indestructible, so that doesn't really do much. Just gives them a basic. Also, nobody really plays him anymore, to be fair. Well, yeah. Uh, um, we've got Jingataxius. So that's, yeah, that's, that's a big one. Score up to like eight or nine, I think. Okay. And uh, like the Kess. Oh yeah, the, Jeleva. Okay. So I'd say a couple, right? Maybe more. So. The, I, I guess the lead-in question there is, do we replace Abrupt Decay with this, or nah. play in no, a Diddy? No, you play both. You play both. You play I think, both. I think both. Like, I'd, if I'm not playing some sort of build that really, really values one mana removal and interaction, then I think it's fine to replace something like a Pongify or even a Swords to Plowshares, if you're running that, with Assassin's Trophy. For instance, like in my uh, Bug Red control style decks, uh, I'm probably going to be replacing Submerge with Assassin's Trophy. My god, That's you ran you can, Submerge in those? You can cast it for free if they have a forest or something. Yo, or you have a yeah. That's the top okay. of the library. Submerge <laughs> is amazing. That card Man, is you, actually You've good. been going deep. <laughs> that, it's a good card. Seriously. In, in Legacy? I don't know if I think that I, I don't know. I I guess you've been broadening off of Adnos as a one card win con, so I guess it makes sense that you'd be playing better free removal that weakens Adnos. Yeah, yeah. I, all right, I see it. I see it. It's good. Yeah, it's a good card. I'm, actually, I don't think it's a very good card. Um, yeah, anybody who's watching, <laughs> just send me your copies because I don't think I'm gonna uh, play. Yeah, oh, well. yeah, I'm. I am a bit sad about it being like still $40. twenty euro on card market $40? Are yeah. you serious? Yeah, it's, what? Yeah, it's between like 35 that. and 40 you're going to see. Is... You are all welcome to send me foil copies. <laughs> right, Thank yeah, you. we'll sign them and eventually... Yeah, and then them we'll keep them. Yeah. Yeah, sounds like a deal, doesn't it? Uh... And it's cheaper to ship to Raleigh <laughs> than to Germany, so... Uh, this is true. Your boy needs his copies. All four. <laughs> uh, Think of the yeah. children. Great card. Uh, <laughs> interestingly on. enough, I think to sum it up, we can say Abrupt Decay in CDH, it is not in every other format. It's probably more than that, but we still like Abrupt Decay a bit more. Uh, the decks that do play Abrupt Decay will probably, however, also be playing Assassin's Trophy because both are fantastic. Yes. Yeah, you, heard, yeah, you heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> so, nobody else is talking about this card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, Knight of Autumn. Uh right. it's a three mana creature, two one, costs one a green and a white. It's a dryad knight. Reclamation. I'm so glad knight. this is not a human. Yeah. Um, when Knight of Autumn enters the battlefield, choose one. Either put two plus one plus one counters on Knight of Autumn, destroy target artifact or enchantment. Or you gain four life. This card was very, very specifically not chosen to be a human or an elf. <laughs> and I honestly appreciate <laughs> wizards. Thank you, yes. whoever was in charge of making sure this was not a human or an elf for that distinction. Modern does not need this card as a human. It is a powerful <laughs> enough sideboard option allowing you to condense Reclamation Sage effects and Kitchen Finks effects into one card, freeing up slots, which is already a really good thing for the format. This does not need to be human-triggered. And for every other format, this doesn't need to be an elf, because, come on now, that's just absurd <laughs> power creep. Yeah. As far as our format goes, because it is not an elf, it is arguably weaker than Reclamation Sage because you can't do some of your elf shenanigans with Priest of Titania with it. It is still a very powerful effect because it enables you to have incidental life gain or technically a body that can kill Timna without dying for the same cost as the Rex Sage, same relative cost, and still has that option. So as a card, I still think this is very good. If you're running Priest of Titania, Rex Sage is maybe better. If you're not running Priest of Titania, I think this is pretty solidly better. Hmm. I could... <clears throat> so... I, I'm thinking of something that's... that's Sylvan Safekeeper. 
Why is that a human? <laughs> because elves would have been too powerful and it, uh, type. I two. mean, look at the picture, and it says Sylvan. Sorry, he does I, have I, pointed I, ears. I I'm you, know, sorry. You, you make a good point. <laughs> Wait, does does anyway. he actually? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, well, he does. I the, think the person who 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 did the illustration, the original, because there's more than one illustration for it. The original yeah. illustration, I mean, it's clearly an elf, which um, is amusing because it was modeled after a human. Right. And it is a human. But yeah, that's tangential. But, if right. important. That's to not note. being reprinted. So yes. Yeah. DRN <laughs> yeah. does not have Sylvan Sidekeeper reprinted. But we do have uh, Knight of Reclamation Finks. And yes. <laughs> so okay. Is this something that's always in other formats aside, is this something that is always just gonna be on the middle mode? Or are we ever gonna use the life gain? Are we ever gonna use the plus plus? Oh yeah, uh, I think it'll usually be very, mode. very rarely the plus mode. I think the life gain is like essentially irrelevant, probably. I, I could see the life gain if you if you're playing a Nas deck, and you I can see the life gain in weird board stalls where you've like blood potted your opponent who's on Hulk Weaver down, and you're just grinding each other out, and four in, life matters. But I don't. It's in very rare situations. Yeah. Uh, one point I do want to make that uh, makes me also think that Rex Sage is still better than Knight of Autumn is that green-white is actually a significant color requirement, especially when you're under a Blood Moon. Yeah, that's... Unless you're playing Tayshar. You're doing Tayshar loops. Sure. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I guess. <laughs> you are correct. Let's keep going. I don't think there's anything yeah. else to say about this one. Not really. Like it's it's a second reclamation sage. If you want another one, here it is. It's also got some niche upsides. Uh, he says enjoy. saying more about the card. Yes, that's my uh, mo. Yes. Next card on the list. Let's do it. Um, Lazav the Multifarious. Mm -hmm. He is a legendary creature shapeshifter. He costs a blue and a black. He's a 1-3, and when Lazav the Multifarious enters the battlefield, surveil 1. I'm sold! <laughs> we are not because quite done yet. Oh, really? Yeah, there's, there's more, I know, it's surprising, but you can pay Oh, X I thought that was mana. flavor text. <laughs> Getting with it, X. It would be some interesting flavor text, that's for sure. <laughs> Lazav, the Multifarious, becomes a copy of target creature card in your graveyard with converted mana cost X, except its name is still Lazav, the Multifarious. It's legendary in addition to its other types, and it has this ability. I think yep. this guy's pretty cool. I love the art. I like that you don't just have to have the ability functional for him to be a competent play because he lets you surveil one and he can block Pimna. I feel like some pun's going to get sick of us saying that, even though it's like <laughs> frequently irrelevant. Right. Um, and also new shenanigans, like yeah. you can just do stuff with so, Necrotic Ooze. If I can interject for a quick second about the Timna thing, I kind of feel... Like, it blocks Timna is this format's equivalent to uh, incidental life gain on cards, like draw a card, gain some life, that kind of stuff. That's what blocks Timna is for us. That's probably something we could unpack in an entire video, though. Right. <laughs> yeah. So we'll leave it at that. Okay, uh, yeah, Necrotic Ooze. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to go over it. There's just shenanigans you can do. You can combo with it. Necrotic Ooze is also deserving of its own video. So, Right. I, I feel like this is just kind of another copy of Necrotic Ooze. I, I don't know. Um, I feel like there's got to be some sort of a, a crazy Hulk pile that you can do. Um, yeah, where you mana. throw Walking Ballista in the yard for free and then do something where you turn him into something that has counters, and then flip them over mm -hmm. to the ballista and kill. Lazav, uh, Priest of Gix, and Visser Seer. <laughs> what? What does That's your Priest of style. Gix do? Is that the one that makes Peter. mana? Yeah. Uh, and then just do stuff, and then you win. Easy. 
Hmm. So mm, I don't know. The, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Like this the, guy can do stuff with news. Yeah, the buried right. alive pile that uh, was found for him or one. There's probably a handful, <laughs> but a lot. like the the most apparent one or the one that people immediately thought of was necrotic ooze, Phyrexian devourer, walking ballista. Yeah, that sounds about right. Right. So that's one option. Uh, one thing I've been looking at for this card is uh, that it could provide some interesting extra flexibility in Hulk piles. For instance, in the case where you've discarded one of your uh, combo pieces. Like most of the cards in your Hulk piles are usually one or two mana, which means if you run this, you uh, get some backup in case you get wheeled or you want to set up survival stuff and the only creatures you have in hand are your combo pieces, then uh, this guy can sort of stand in if you're willing to pay a bit of extra mana. That's pretty slick. I like it. Now, I'm not sure if that's, like, worth the inclusion on its own, but it right. is, is, is something that to be... think about. So, um, is that going to be better than just having something else that's two mana, say, um, Shallow Grave, Animate Dead, Dance of the Dead, um, life um, yeah that's that, that's kind of I mean, a question they, like you can control for it in the hulk pile though i think that's the relevant distinction in like in theory you can also make spell seeker hulk piles that get you reanimate or shallow grave or something like that if you so desire but those also come with some uh, challenges like one of the important things for instance about breakfast that it used to have as an advantage or uh, uh, as an advantage over most other Hulk decks was that it won off a single Hulk trigger. It didn't have to reanimate Hulk, which uh, usually gives the deck some kind of weakness because if you exile Hulk with its trigger on the stack, they can't get it back, so they can't do the pile, etc. Uh, Lazav might serve a similar role to Spellseeker in that you can play around these like weird situations. But he might be able to do it without necessitating a multi-Hulk pile. That's something I'm going to have to look at for the card and like really think about. If you've got extra seven mana floating around. Yeah, <laughs> Not that. sure that's quite what he means, but the, okay. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I can I see it can now. Do it, yeah. hmm. He's cool. Let's keep going. Okay. All right. Oh, this next one is oh, I love this spicy. Oh, this is so good. I already brewed a deck for this. Um, <laughs> Mnemonic Betrayal, also known as Yorgmoth's Mill. Mm -hmm. It's a sorcery. It costs one, a blue, and a black. Exile all cards from all opponents' graveyards. You may cast those cards this turn, and you may spend mana as though it were any color of any type to cast those spells. At the beginning of the next end step, if any of those cards remain exiled, return them to their owner's graveyards. And now, uh, one line that makes me a bit sad, exile Mnemonic Betrayal. But yeah. that's fair. Oh boy. This card is oh, awesome. Boy. I don't necessarily know exactly how powerful it'll be relative to Yogmoth's will, but I have a feeling it's going to be pretty similar. Because they both function well at the same approximate stage of the game where people have been playing the game. Like, you know, Yogmoth's will on turn one. It's gonna suck then. Like this. This right. is good when people have been blowing through resources and you've had a game and you've all counterspelled each other and you've just done stuff and you're deep into this game and you're trying to look for a way to gain an advantage, be it by drawing extra cards or by breaking this board stall. And Mnemonic Betrayal is a heavy hitter. Instead of just being, have you done stuff? It's, has anyone else done stuff? And the chances of anyone else doing stuff compared to you doing stuff is pretty darn high. Especially if you're at a point where you're considering casting a three mana sorcery that does nothing on its own, mm -hmm. pretty much. Right. So as a late game card advantage finisher engine type deal that can also be incidental graveyard hate. I think this card is awesome. And the art is pretty metal too. So yep. there's looks that. Looks like a, uh, like an, an album cover for some sort of a metal it, band. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of like 
uh, Devin Townsend with some of his album covers. Yeah, I could see that. Sure, I know who that guy is. Uh, do you know like the Badger 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 thing? There's a metal cover of it, and <laughs> Devin Townsend is the one who made it. Oh. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the Monica Trail Coddle. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, so this card, um, I think this is awesome. Um, I think something to note, a lot of people, when they evaluate this, it seems that everyone's like, well, it's going to be really inconsistent because it's completely at you know it's it's going to be determined by what it is that your opponents are doing and it's not going to have value uh, the the evaluations seem to uh, to pretend that uh mass removal doesn't exist um i think that if you play this in a mid-range deck that is intending to have a lot of interaction intending to have uh meltdown kind of effects where you mm -hmm. can just blow away all of the artifacts and then cast this and then get all of them. Um, and then because of the fact that they're artifacts, they they stay around and you've got them um, rather than having them go back to the opponent at the end of turn or something like that. Or, you know, uh, sorcery is an instance there. Well, if you can use it now, then great. But if not, then you're out of luck. Um, being able to grab everybody's fast mana and then hang on to it, even if you can't capitalize it, capitalize on it during that turn I think that'll open up some uh, ways to get the game unstuck um, yeah, I, that's pretty sweet yeah. I hadn't even right. thought about the, uh, the the ramp that you can do with this right it's just absurd um, yeah and you, obviously yes if you want to just go you know wheels tribal or something like that um, <laughs> not a you know not a safe strategy when everybody's got as much free counter spells uh, in every deck, um, but you know, I've I've been testing some some mill stuff, and yes, it's fringe, but this is this just slots right into Verena, and it's it's pretty sweet. It's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah it's pretty That's cool. cool. Yeah, the uh, the deck I brewed up with this is uh, Thrasios Timna. Not much of a surprise, but. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm doing some things. Wait, are you playing Isocrine Scepter? No way! How'd you know? Oh, oh my! I, I think I've seen the deck. So <laughs> go on. Yeah. No, the uh, the ten or so cards I'm playing that other people are not playing are uh, quite interesting this time. I promise. Dramatic reversal. That's oh, is one, but not one of the interesting uh... ones. So. I'm I'm basically doing exactly what you said. Like uh, I'm using cards like Seeds of Innocence mm -hmm. to get mana rocks, or uh, of course, a few board wipes to get mana dorks in the graveyard. Right. To then abuse Mnemonic Betrayal to gain a huge mana advantage, which I'm looking to leverage with Thrasios. Mm -hmm. And then I've got the uh, like Notion Wheel stuff, even Arms Collector on top of it. To wow. Us. That's going deep that, that, for you. That, that's some devotion to the cause right there. Yeah, that might be yeah. the spiciest thing I've ever heard Siggy play. Wow, Alms Collector. Uh, Those may are like I remind you... Go on. I, I don't know, but I need one. But may I remind you of a certain uh, Ur Dragon deck during the CDH mm -hmm. Teams era? Yeah. Please don't. That's, uh, yeah, let's... Uh... What Speaking do they say? Let's dragon. dogs lie. Dragons. Oh my god! I completely missed that segue. I know. I'm, That's why yeah. we did it for you. That yeah, was thank you. Attention. <laughs> we got your back. This is why I there's mean, three of us now. Because when one of us misses puns, the other two will do it. Or you know. Thank you. Clever wordplay. Clever. Yeah. Anyways, Niv miss it. He's he's a big guy for all of us. He costs uh, three blue mana and three red mana, six mana total. He's legendary, of course, uh, as behooves the mighty niv -Mizzet. A dragon wizard, 5-5. Five, five. This spell can't be countered. That's some interesting templating right there. Flying. Same. Whenever you draw a card, niv Paroon 
deals one damage to any target. Whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell, you draw a card. He's pretty cool. If you move past the disgusting mana cost, he does a lot. <laughs> he has a Nezahal esque effect in his uh, draw trigger. He has the usual interacts with his opposite trigger to deal damage clause that Niv Mizzet always has, or I guess in the case of the first, the inverse of that. And he can fuel himself. He's just kind of a cool card. And I want to leave most of this to Cobblepot, because I know you've been talking about him. So right. share um, your wisdom, please, Mr. Sure. Pot. I, I, this is, I mean, hands down, by far and away, the, the best of the niv Mizzets there ever been. Um, not to say that the other two are, are good, but um, <laughs> <laughs> this one... I like it already. <laughs> this one's playable. Uh, <laughs> yes, the, mm. the, the, the mana cost is prohibitive. And that's gonna scare people away. I wouldn't recommend. I don't. I, I don't even want to say that I wouldn't recommend. But um, I'm not planning on playing this as a commander. Um, this is a reanimation target, and it's a very good reanimation target. Um, being able to have a, a creature. I, I mean, yes, Nezahal has been around for a whole couple Six of months. months. Um, this. Wait. I think it was like two years ago, wasn't it? Right. The fact that you can channel the draw into damage um, is very pertinent. So what do we have in the meta today? We've got a lot of Timnadex, a lot of Blood Pod, a lot of hate bears, uh, creatures, you know, that kind of stuff. Being able to just pick them away um, whenever you wheel or whenever you just incidentally draw cards from like Ooh. a brainstorm for instance so um i cast a brainstorm and spread i, I do a um infernal titan you know kind of spread three damage around and pick off your monodorks or triple the, stone the, rain right you know the the notion thief in the timna um <laughs> you know or yeah. you put this so i'm i'm going to use this in raza hulk firebrand the the weird edge uh, fringe curiosity deck. A and, cobble uh, deck. Yeah. Um, it's a reanimator deck, and it runs curiosity and keen sense and those kind of effects. And this thing is... It does a good job in that deck. Um, just reanimate it, or, you know, um, get into play from Hulk, and have Tandem... Uh, what's the Tandem guy? Tandem uh, Lookout. Tandem Lookout in play. And then the game ends. And it's <laughs> it's done a lot of work, and I, I've been surprised by how good it, it is. Um, the fact that it's anybody's instance and sorceries. Um, I mean, if anything, even if you're not using it as a recursive loop to just immediately kill everybody, the fact that you're just going to be pulling in mana when other people do what they do, or, I, I mean, pulling in cards, um, it's... It's, it's really good. I think he's he's quite a bit better than Nezahal. And Nezahal has seen some fringe play in a couple of reanimator lists. So um, I'm excited to try this guy. Um, I've got a couple of lists that are playing with him, and so far it's been really good. Yeah, he seems quite cool. So since you've uh, talked at length about him in the 98 or 99 of decks, I'm uh, going to briefly mention Niv Mizzet as a commander. Now, uh, Izzet has always been in a bit of a tough spot in terms of useful commanders, or like really strong commanders. Sure. We do have, like, uh, we did have some fringe stuff before, like uh, some people played Nin, and then we got Mizzix first, which enabled like a decent storm deck. Of course, it's like no Kess or Jaleva or even Zer, but it's quite functional. If you want to play Izzet, you can play Mizzix, Storm, and you'll be fine. Uh, then we got Joyra, which obviously has some good artifact synergies, which uh, also ended up spawning a decent deck. And I kind of have a feeling that Niv Mizzet is about on par with those two. So, 
what does Niv Mizzet do for us? He uh, wins off Dramatic Scepter just by himself if he's on the field. You can even like do Scepter before you cast him if you have uh, rocks that make colored mana. So it's kind of nice because he is an outlet for Scepter, but Scepter also makes it easier for you to cast him. Right. Uh, he also wins with Paradox Engine and like any spell on a Scepter, which is also great. And on top of that, he also does the classic Niv Mizzet thing of winning with Curiosity Effects, if that's what you want to do. So, uh, win conditions have historically been one of the things that Blue Red has struggled with. And Niv Mizzet provides a good solution to that issue due to having several different avenues of winning the game. So I'm hearing you say that Niv Mizzet is is its version of Thrasios. That's mm. a little generous. <laughs> but in a really like squint your eyes and tilt your head and put a blindfold on kind of way. Yeah. I'd say right. it's I the mean, closest joking we've gotten. Right. I mean, two mana versus six mana, it's it's pretty close. But um the one place that I would caution you in that kind of comparison is specifically with regards to budget decks. I've actually done a few different budget scepter builds, including a Niv Mizzet one. Mm -hmm. This Niv Mizzet, while better as a card, you will kind of want to do some numbers math on to be careful with because his mana cost is more restrictive and less rock beneficial. So if you're playing with a lower budget and you don't necessarily have the fetches and the duels that let you cast triple blue, triple red for a backup um, like creature spell, this is going to be significantly harder because a lot of the budget mana rocks make colorless mana. You're going to be slightly more RNG reliant with your draws onto what mana you can produce from your lands. Mm -hmm. So some of the older Niv Mizzets or the Scorpion God, Scorpion God, Locust God, Locust God, are yep. potentially going to be better as your budget decreases, despite being weaker commanders and weaker cards. Oh yeah, that does make a lot of sense, yeah. Agreed. And with that, I think we've concluded all of the cards we wanted to talk about for Guilds of Ravnica. Do you guys have any general thoughts on this set, just that you want to share with our viewers? Man, I love Ravnica. What a cool place. I I mean, yes. The Vorthos <laughs> part of it is great. Um, this wasn't a, a very good set, seemingly. Um, I mean, we don't I, I think we've gotten a little bit uh the past couple of sets have been very very good i mean dominaria and some of the things out of uh a couple of the other more recent sets kaladesh especially mm -hmm. um it's this is i think more typical of what we've been used to as far as how much stuff that we get of value out of a set um and it it feels like a big step down because of what we've been accustomed to recently. So it's a little disappointing. I think it is still a step up from some of the downswings we've had, like in the Amun Kep block and in the Ixalan block. Right. So I think if this is more of a return to normalcy after Dominaria's peak, I'm more or less okay with that. Limited looks fairly interesting. Standard looks like it's going to be relatively healthy. We've got mm -hmm. players for Modern, we have some interesting cards for Legacy, we have a lot of fun Commander cards, we have some decent competitive Commander cards. I think this hits a reasonable sweet spot where none of the formats that Wizards like doesn't care about, and I'm like putting that in heavy quotes, are getting like killed by it because there's nothing. None of them are getting <laughs> super power creep because they accidentally treasure cruise, and no one's really getting left out. Besides Vintage, I guess, which still gets Assassin's Trophy, which, you know, but... Right. In general, I think this is a decent spot for them to be hitting with a set. Yeah. I could agree with that, yeah. I uh, still, I mean, looking at Kaladesh, where we had, <laughs> let's see here, um, Paradox Engine, Aetherflux Reservoir, 
Um, Dramatic reversal. Yeah. If we forget about the artifact blocks where wizard almost <laughs> kills magic, sure. Mirrored in one, yeah. In general, I think this is a healthy place to be, though. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fully agree. And uh, what I specifically like is that we didn't just get like absolute easy slot in staples like assassin's trophy, but also a handful of things that might make uh, some more fringe strategies better or more interesting and a good handful of cards that are just like cool to experiment with and to see whether they're going to be good enough because those i feel are really the things that keep people interested in the format in the longer run right yeah there's something for the spikes timmies and johnnies of our format yes and on that note thank you all for watching Thank you, Siggy and Cobble, for joining me in this competitive EDH set review of Guilds of Ravnica. I have been Dan as usual, and I will see you next time. Have a good one.